like the wind, unseen but present, moving and felt, like the seasons, changing at exactly the right time, like the pull of gravity that keeps me firmly planted to the ground beneath my feet, your faithfulness, the same yesterday, today, and forever, immovable, unshakable. Your love is steadfast and you keep every one of your promises. You will never leave and you never forsake the ones you love. You finish everything you start and never have you spoken a word in vain. As undeniable as the sun, rising day in and day out without fail, and just as certain as the setting of that same sun, you are faithful. One week ago, we gathered here on Easter Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And today we gather again as Easter people, still holding the hope of that resurrection in our hearts, believing it is 100% real. And I don't ever want to miss an opportunity to celebrate and worship the resurrected Christ. So I hope you will join us, join our team in that, join in this time this morning. So I invite you to stand. We're going to sing some songs in the beginning. If you are online, please worship along with everyone here. Let's stand together and sing. <laughs> Let's give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord. Our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn. Love endures forever. 
Hey, take a moment before you sit down and tell folks around you how glad you are to sing with them this morning. Good morning. It's good to worship with you all this morning. My name is Tim Ward. I'm the pastor here at Crossroads. Do you know, statistically, attendance on the Sunday after Easter is the worst of any Sunday in the entire, and look at you people. Hey, give yourselves a hand. Come on. That's great news. And if you're online, we're excited you're here too today. We wanna welcome you. Um, I wanna tell you, Crossroads is a church where it doesn't matter what your story is, doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter where you're coming from, you're welcome here. And in some way, I hope you experience something today. Whatever that might be, whatever you need, I hope you experience it today. And I hope somebody says hello to you. Because there are people who go every single week without anybody saying hi to them or without somebody saying their name, and I hope you experience that. I wanna encourage you, if you're here in person, to take out your worship guide. If you're online, you can go to crossroadsnova.org slash here. Take out this card inside if you're here in person. If you're online, you can fill it out online. Or if you have the app, you can fill it out on the app. Take the time to fill out this card. In a few moments, the ushers are gonna come around and receive them. I wanna encourage you, fill them out. Check the boxes on the back. We deeply believe in being engaged and connected with one another, and I hope you'll take the time to do that. Even if you say, look, I'm just here visiting, we pray for every single name that's on this card. 
Every single name, and we don't know your story. Friends, I got to hear lots of people's stories this week of lots of realities and lots of challenges that are going on. So put your name on the card. Our staff promises that we will pray for you by name this week. So I wanna encourage you to do that. I wanna tell you about a few things that are coming up. Again, we are a church. It's about connecting, about engaging with one another. You have an opportunity to do that today at one o'clock at Udvar Hazy. You, you see Udvar Hazy from one to 2.30. Uh, it says family. Family is up to you. If you come by yourself, that's your family. If you come with your two friends, that's your family. But Graham, who's our kids ministry director, will be standing out front greeting people who have a little crossroads sign. A few minutes before one, he'll be there and he'll stay out until 1.10 and then folks are gonna go in and experience that together. It's a cool thing to do. It's a gift that we have that it's super local and it's a great thing that folks can do together. So I wanna encourage you to do that. If you have a middle school or high school student, tonight at 6.30, there's a game night. I wanna invite you to come, invite you to invite your neighbors. It's a fun thing. You don't have to sign up. You can just pop in and that'll be great. We shared in an email to the church this week about Jen's score. If you don't know who Jen is, maybe you're new to the church, maybe you haven't been here that long. Jen, somebody who's on our staff, Jen served faithfully in this church for years and years and years and made a huge impact, not just on our multimedia, which she worked on, but Jen was a huge partner and a huge instigator of our relationship in Uganda. And Jen passed away this week on early Tuesday morning, and we're gonna celebrate Jen's life on May 17th. There was a sign-up that went out if you wanna help out with that at 3 p.m. I wanna encourage you to block that time. Come and celebrate Jen's life. It's gonna be live streamed as well if you need that, but I think it's gonna be a great way to continue to allow Jen's story to continue. Last week I said that we are a people of hope, and the hope that we have is that that is not the end of Jen's story. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's claim that hope and hold on to it. I'm gonna go ahead and invite the ushers to come forward. They're gonna come and they're gonna receive your connection cards. They're gonna receive your giving. If you weren't able to give to the Easter offering and you still wanna give to that, there's an opportunity for that. Our Easter offering, by the way, is at 76,000 and growing. And our goal was to get to 86 to 90,000. So if you still wanna give to that, I invite you to do it. But as you give, know that your generosity absolutely transforms people's lives.
of faith. <laughs> and I have found that to be true. Uh, doubt is, is sort of the mechanism by which faith evolves. It's Doubt is how, how you cultivate that posture of having an open hand. Um, doubt is what tells you that maybe this thing that you think is fundamental, that's non-negotiable, maybe it is. Maybe geocentrism is not central to the Christian faith. Maybe a young earth is not central to the Christian faith. So I'm grateful for doubt in my life because it, it has taught me that I can get, be, get some stuff wrong. I can be wrong, even in matters of faith. It's made me more humble, more dependent on Christ. Um, so I'm grateful for doubt. It keeps faith, it keeps my faith alive and thinking and um, where certainty sort of just freezes it, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think, I think doubt plays an important role in faith. I don't think it's the opposite of faith. I think it um, keeps faith awake, alive, thinking, movable, changeable. I just want to be yielded. I really do. I want, 
even as I've, I've changed and I've, I have new convictions, um, I want to stay open to the fact that I get stuff wrong, that the church has gotten stuff wrong in the past, and I, I want to have a tender, yielded heart that can change when I'm wrong. And I don't see how else to do that unless I have a healthy place for doubt and second thoughts in my life. It makes faith a little more challenging. <laughs> it makes it a little harder sometimes, but I've found that it makes it more real. Well, I'm not willing, I've heard from so many pastors who have told me, if you just take your emotions out of it, if you just take your intellectual struggles out of your faith, then you'll be a better obedient Christian. I'm just, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to be a robot as I, in, on this journey. I want to follow Jesus with my head and my heart fully engaged, alive, awake. That's a bigger risk. It's a bigger risk to stay engaged, but I'm not willing to be a Christian any other way. I don't know how to be a Christian any other way. And I don't think Jesus called me to be a Christian any other way. I wonder if you'd pray with me and for me this morning. Gracious God, I pray that the words that come out of my mouth might somehow be honoring and pleasing to you. God, that you would give each of us ears to hear what we need to hear this morning. That our minds would be open to understanding, that our hearts would be willing to be transformed, that our certainties would be open to challenge. Come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. If you don't know Rachel Held Evans, Rachel Held Evans is a, an amazing theologian who the world lost way too soon, way too young. And I love what she says in there, doubt keeps faith awake. Doubt keeps faith awake. We're starting a new series today called Disrupting Doubt. And here's the funny thing, friends. There are churches where you will go that will say, if you doubt, you are not a good Christian. There are places where you will go that say, if you challenge something the pastor says, then you are not a good Christian. I had lunch with somebody in our church this week, and he said, I love after we leave your messages. And I said, okay, tell me more. And he said, because we disagree with a lot of it. <laughs> he says, then it spurs great conversation. And I said, that's the gift right there. Faith should not be something that we can't talk about. It shouldn't be something that we can't investigate. It should not be something that we can't dive more deeply into. Now, you may think it's funny that I'm talking about doubt this morning. After last week, if you came for Easter, I talked about the assurance of the resurrection. Right? What a fascinating thing to come back to a week later. But the truth is, doubt is something, as Rachel says, that propels our faith that pushes us on. Now today specifically, we're gonna dive into this idea of disrupting doubt. You notice I didn't say getting rid of doubt, right? Because what is the opposite of faith? Certainty, right? Some people like to paint this world where the opposite of faith is doubt and it's simply not true. Doubt is something that propels us in our faith. Now some time ago, I was thinking about this concept and I was really interested in what people thought about this idea of doubt. So I put on social media, I said, tell me some things you doubt about when it comes to God. And I wanna share you just a few of the responses that sort of encapsulated things. Here's the first one. Now while I don't doubt God, I certainly doubt the Bible because it was written by man and many accounts within it don't ladder up to current science, current beliefs, or standard practices. So that's a doubt folks have. I've experienced doubt when bad things happen to good people, not just me, but especially kids, okay? Probably one of my biggest doubts I think about is how there are so many other religions and different beliefs. I think, how do I know we're the only ones who are right? I have doubts about prayer. Jesus taught us how to pray, so he wants us to, but so often people who love God and have so many people praying for them die despite the prayers and desires of many. That was resonating over and over again. I don't understand why if God is loving and I pray to a loving God, something doesn't happen and something doesn't transform. What's interesting and what's in fascinating about these questions, very few of people wrote, I doubt the existence of God. Most people, whether it's God or something else, believe in a higher power. 
something bigger than themselves. But where people get caught up is when sometimes the doctrine of the church tries to put God in this comfortable little box where if you don't believe this square and you're not in this square, then God simply can't be God. And I gotta tell you, my experience of God is not that at all. Whenever I try to put God neatly into a box, God blows the top off the box. God says, this isn't the way. God pushes, and actually, if you read the Gospels, if you look at how Jesus interacts with people over and over and over again, they like to put God in this nice little religious box, and Jesus says, oh, for goodness sakes, get out of there. God is bigger than your imagination. Now, I wanna take you to a story today, a story that comes just after the resurrection of Jesus in the Gospel according to John. It's about Thomas. Now, some of you may have heard about Thomas. He was one of the disciples, and he is incorrectly labeled Doubting Thomas. I like to call him Normal Thomas. (laughs) He has real questions, real things. In fact, I would argue that Thomas is the most faithful of all of the disciples because he asks questions. I want to give you some background. I want to take you backwards a little bit. In John chapter 11, Jesus is headed to Judea to raise a guy, Lazarus, from the dead. Now, the travel is dangerous. Getting there is going to be challenging. And Jesus goes to the disciples and he says, we're going to do this. We're going to go to this place and we're going to go and help this guy, Lazarus. And they're all freaking out. They're all saying it's too dangerous. But listen to what Thomas said. It says, then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Doubting Thomas, huh? Doubting Thomas is the one that says, let's go. If it's too dangerous, at least we'll be with Jesus. That's the way to go. There's an interesting confidence found in his statement. Would you agree? He's saying, let's not talk him out of it. I know you might not think it's a good idea, but let's remember he's Jesus Let's do it. Let's walk with him. He says, I'm committed, but let's be clear. We're going to (laughs) die. Right? I mean, come on. He's like, y'all, we're all in, but we're not getting out of this. And then we see Thomas again in chapter 14. Jesus is talking about his impending death, about his ascension into heaven, and all of the disciples are sitting. I think this is a moment in the scripture, like Hans Christian Andersen's story of the emperor's new clothes, where everybody sees the emperor and they're like, that guy's naked, but we're not allowed to say it, right? And this little kid goes, hey, you're naked, king. That's like Thomas. Thomas is the one that names the truth in the situation. It says in verse five, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? The scripture is very clear. The rest of the disciples were silent. And Thomas goes, I wanna go with you. Tell me the way. So it's crazy, again, that he's labeled Doubting Thomas, and as if that's a negative thing about his personality. He's the only kid in the class that says what every other kid is thinking, right? He's the one that actually teachers want, the one that will raise their hand that says, hey, none of us understand this math before the test comes, right? That's Thomas. He says, Jesus, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Because Thomas is practical. He's real. He's down to earth. He pushes, but not for the sake of pushing. He pushes for the sake of understanding. He wants to know Jesus more. He wants to engage him more. So now I take you to just after the resurrection in John chapter 20. I want to read you a few verses here. This is after Jesus has been raised from the dead. It says, so the other disciples told him, talking to Thomas, who wasn't in the room, We've seen the Lord, but he, being Thomas, said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. The doors, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. That's not freaky at all, right? Jesus comes in, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God. Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus appears to the disciples in this locked room. Thomas is not there. 
We don't know where his friends run off and find him, but they tell him the news. How does Thomas react? Like Thomas. He reacts in a normal way. You might be thinking he'd be jumping up and down, Jesus is alive, but this is impossible for him to believe because see, Thomas saw what happened on Friday. He knew what happened in the story, so for people to come to him and say, Jesus is alive, and Thomas says a normal thing. He says, prove it. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, you can read that and you can say, isn't Thomas an awful person? Or you can read that and say, well, he's normal, right? He wants to see Jesus. He's not gonna believe some story that the other disciples have told because things have been crazy. Things are, are nuts right now. What's wrong with Thomas? Why does he doubt? Would you believe everyone else? He's simply asking to see what everybody else already saw. They already heard the story. The women came into a room where they were locked and stowed away. And Thomas goes, I just wanna see what everybody else gets to see. I wanna experience Jesus. He's honest about his emotions. Friends, when I talk to somebody who is doubting their faith, who is struggling with their faith, it's a powerful and a real thing. And listen, what I wanna clarify here, I'm not talking about people who say, who are atheists and say God doesn't exist at all. I'm saying people who've been on a journey of faith and say I'm struggling with this aspect of faith. I'm struggling with this piece of it. I doubt if God could really do this. I doubt this concern, this thing or that thing. I'm talking about those of us who have faith, including myself, but who have doubts. Right, there are questions I have about God. There are questions I have about the nature of God. And what I recognize is I am rarely actually doubting God and more actually doubting the things that I've been taught about God. I am more challenging the box that people have put God in. If we look at doubts that are raised, they are rarely about the existence of God, but they are often about an aspect of God that someone told us that we just don't understand. Something like if you're a Christian, your life's gonna be easy. Well, that is a doubt that has imploded multiple times for me, right? Something like, just pray and it'll all be fixed, eh. right? If you just pray, they'll get better, and then they don't, right? Those are the challenges that people run into. There's a story in Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Hope, and he wrote a lot of these books. Lee Strobel was an agnostic atheist, depending on what day you ask him. He was somebody who really didn't believe in God, and he wrote a book to, to scientifically disprove God and ended up actually proving the existence of God in his own life. But he gets to this book, The Case for Hope, and he tells a story, and this is a story about Rick Warren. You may have heard of Rick Warren. He's a pastor in a large Baptist church, and he wrote this book, The Purpose Driven Life, which was really big in the late 90s, early 2000s. Everybody had to read it. If you didn't read it, you weren't a Christian, right? If you didn't read the book, The Purpose Driven, or your life had no purpose, one of those two things. But he tells this story about Rick Warren. Rick Warren's 27-year-old son committed suicide. And it was a really big story and lots of people were challenging him and people were saying really awful things like his life is better now or he was a terrible person and he did these things for his son. And he asked Rick Warren, like, how do you deal with this? How do you handle this? And about a year after the tragedy, Rick said this. I'm gonna read it to you. He says, I've often been asked, how have you made it? How have you kept going in your pain? And I've often replied, the answer is Easter. You see, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus happened over three days. He says, Friday was the day of suffering and pain and agony. Saturday was the day of doubt and confusion and misery. But Easter, that Sunday was the day of hope and joy and victory. And here's the fact of life. You'll face these three days over and over and over in your lifetime. And when you do, you'll find yourself asking, as I did, three fundamental questions. Number one, what do I do in my days of pain? Two, how do I get through my days of doubt and confusion? And three, how do I get to the days of joy and victor, victory? And he says, the answer is always Easter. Easter is always the answer. Easter is not a Sunday, friends. Easter is a hope. It's a belief in something beyond ourselves, a hope that is greater than ourselves. Now listen, if you come to me 
and you tell me about some tragedy in your life and I just look at you and say, Easter. <laughs> Not helpful. <laughs> but I do think this paradigm of thinking about life as three days that we will step through pain, that we will step through uncertainty, and hopefully that we will step into hope is a powerful way to think about life, is a powerful way to journey together. I wonder if you've heard a pastor make things too simple, if you've heard someone say to you, you shouldn't have doubt. I wonder if someone has trivialized God in such a way to put God in a box for you that makes you uncomfortable. See, friends, I think the reason that doubt makes us nervous I think it makes us nervous because there is somebody at some point in time that told us if we doubt, we're not a real Christian. We don't have real faith. And I'm here today to tell you that's simply wrong. It's just not true. I think doubt is actually about different stages of faith. I I, I do not think there's a point in life where doubt never enters the picture anymore. I think it's part of our journey. I think our doubts and our questions are real. I think Thomas is an incredible disciple. You know, Jesus says, blessed are those who don't, uh, who don't need to see and believe. C.S. Lewis says that was Jesus' way of thanking Thomas for raising the question. I was saying, isn't that great? I'm glad Thomas, oh no, by the way, did you notice Thomas, the scripture never says he actually touched the hand? It never says he actually went forth. Jesus says, come and touch my hands, and Thomas goes, got it. I'm good, I believe. It's a powerful, powerful thing. See, I think doubt is like this set of stairs. We have a picture of a set of stairs. I think your faith, a lot of people like to think of faith that goes like this. I don't know about you, but that's never been my experience. That one day I wasn't a Christian and I got to the end and all was great and perfect. But instead that I have these moments that are real highs and then I have these moments that are flat. And there are moments where I'm trying to discern and I'm trying to grow. And there are moments where I'm saying, God, I need more of you. I need to understand more of you. But it's those moments that propel me to the next place. And then I get on another flat space and it's that moment that propels me again. It's a powerful, powerful reality when we doubt and we continue. Because I actually do believe that Easter is about hope. I actually do believe in God, I believe that the resurrection is real. And I know a lot of people struggle with that, but I really believe it. See, often college is one of those times when students really struggle with their faith because as parents, and I do this with my own kids, I make them come to church, right? On Sunday mornings, you don't get to sleep in in our house. And at some point, my kids are gonna have to decide if that's theirs for themselves. They're gonna have to discern if that's there for themselves. And the truth is, most people struggle in college not because college is this time of wild oats, but college is this time where you actually start learning at a different level. You question things in a different way, and I think it's healthy that students do that. And the great thing about being parents is we get to still be there on the other side of it. We get to journey with them and walk with them. Friends, people have all kinds of problems. There were several people that really hated Rick Warren's statement that he said. They didn't like it because what it meant was that there were seasons of doubt were okay. Friends, there are people who look at Thomas and say, isn't he an awful disciple? I'm super impressed with that guy. I love his story. I love the way he moved quickly from doubt to inquiry about doubt. See, the other disciples weren't as adventurous. Did you hear where they were when Thomas was out? They were locked in a room. It's real easy to have no doubt when you never leave the room. It's real easy when you don't have to deal with the problems of the world to just stick and lock yourself up in there. And Thomas doesn't do that. I mean, let's look at it again. It says a week later, his disciples were in the house again, still there, and Thomas was with them. He had come. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. I love what Thomas says when he says, my Lord and my God. He made a claim in that moment that said, my doubts are part of my real faith, but at the end of the day, you are still my Lord and my God. 
That's the thing, friends. Thomas believed he had doubt, but his doubt was disrupted in that moment. I am sure that wasn't the end of his doubt. I'm sure that wasn't the end of his story. He knew that there was a time to break the doubt. Let's not say that that Thomas is this bad disciple. Because when we do and we qualify it in that way, then we're telling people when they have questions about God, it's over. You're not a real person. So how do we disrupt doubt? I wanna give you a couple of things, really briefly, because I think there are ways that we can stop doubt in its tracks, not from, not from not dealing with it, but I think there are ways that we can keep it from consuming us. Here's the first thing. If you're in a season of doubt about the nature of God, keep pursuing God. Don't stop. Whenever I talk to people about doubt, my biggest encouragement is that they don't stop seeking. How do you do this? Find a quiet place and say, God, I need you. God, reveal yourself to me. God, speak to me. And then do my favorite thing in prayer, shut up. Really, let God speak. So often we have these doubts about God and things happen and we go, God, why aren't you, why aren't you, why aren't you? And God goes, I'm trying to speak. I'm trying to say something to you. So be still and listen for the voice of God. The second way, read the Gospels over and over again. Read them, because I gotta tell you, when you read those things, it's hard. It is hard to read them, to read the consistent stories that happen and not believe that God is powerful. Over and over and over again. I remember I had a friend who I met, and he really struggled with his faith. I mean, had a lot of turmoil in his life. And he said, Tim, I have to read the Gospels every single day of my life because it's in reading those that I am re-propelled to say, all right, let's try it again today. Every single day. Read the Gospels, they're powerful. Third, seek answers, talk to friends. Talk to me. Talk to somebody in your church. Don't Google, that's not helpful at all. But seek answers. Google's awful. Um, if you work there, I'm sorry. I'm just saying the things people put on there. Oh, I'll probably get in trouble for that. All right. Talk to someone. Ask the questions. Get in a small group. They don't have all the answers in small groups, by the way. But there are probably other people that are struggling with the same thing you are. Or who have been in that moment and are struggling in that moment. Talk to people. And finally, don't just doubt for doubt's sake. If you come today and you're like, I don't really have a lot of doubts, don't go home and think you gotta come up with three. You really don't. I mean, seriously, there are people in this world who say, if you don't doubt, you're not a real Christian. I mean, can we stop all that? Can we let go of all of that? If you have struggles, if you have doubts, that's okay. They're real. They're real challenges. I was walking with a family this week through a real difficult situation. And I have to tell you, as I was talking to them, beautiful, beautiful family, really incredible people, the one said to the other, you're such a good person, I don't know why God would allow this to happen to you. And I have to tell you, it wasn't two days later that this person was saying, thank God. That's real. And you know what? God can handle all of it. If you don't think that God can handle your doubt, you have a very small God. God. God can handle it, and I invite you to offer it to God. The biggest thing is don't give up. Don't stop. Don't run away. Because the truth is God wants to walk with you through every single thing. That's the great thing about Thomas. He didn't quit. He said things that other people wouldn't say. He threw out those moments. He challenged things. He questioned things. But at the end of the day, we have the gift of his story. And his story is transformative for us all. Amen? All right. Friends, we're gonna receive communion together. There is something powerful that happens at the table where Christ has the ability to meet us in the midst of our story, in the midst of the questions, in the midst of the doubt, and say, I love you. Just come. It's an open table. All are invited. You know, this is another one of those things, and I know I say this often. There's much of the church that has tried to keep people away from the table. And you can go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible 
where Moses is having the Passover feast and Moses says to God, God, who gets to come? And God says, let everybody come. You know, when we transpose the words to fit what we want them to fit, we become exclusive people. But the table is incredibly inclusive. There's nothing you can do to earn coming here and there's nothing you can do to keep you away. Christ says, come. Come and receive. The ushers will direct you. There's four stations that you'll come to. There's a gluten-free option in the middle if you'd like that option. There's also prepared cups at every station and there's a gluten-free cup at each station if you need that too that's pre-ready for you if you prefer that. But as Jesus walked with his disciples through that last meal that they had, that last supper, they sat around the table. And I'd like to think, and I've even said it before, that there were lots of questions Seems that Thomas was the one that was really good at asking questions, though. And as they sat around the table, Jesus talked to them about things that were changing and about how he wouldn't be with them the way that he was once with them. And I'm sure they were confused, but they were afraid to ask the question, how do we know the way to the place that you will go? And at that meal, in a moment, to connect with them, Jesus took bread. And he gave thanks to God, and then he broke the bread. And he gave it to those disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. As often as you eat bread, remember me. Connect with me. And when the supper was over, he poured into the cup. And he took the cup. And he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to those disciples and he said, hey, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, the new promise poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink from the cup, Jesus said, remember me. Let's pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, on all of us gathered here and those gathered online and over these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body of Christ for the world, recognizing that we're redeemed by his blood. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in mission to all the world. Let us deeply love. God, in our doubt, let us continue to pursue you as you constantly pursue us. God, let us not forget how we are not on this journey alone. And let us not demonstrate to the world that anybody is on this journey alone. Thank you, God, for your deep love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to invite those who are serving communion to come on up. As they come up and get ready and get into place, just know that all are welcome to receive.
into your light again into your light again So the answer is Easter. The hope is found in Easter. I love Thomas. He's my favorite disciple. Some people like Peter. <laughs> Mine's Thomas. I love the questions he asks. Mm -hmm. Keep asking the questions and allow Christ to meet you in the middle of your story. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thanks to the Lord.
Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love 